At CitizenCon 2949 in 2019, Tony Zurovec, director of the Persistent Universe at CIG, conducted a presentation that quite literally changed my life. That's because at CitizenCon 2949, Tony revealed the thing that I think will make Star Citizen one of the most unique games ever made, a dynamic universe called Quantum. Welcome Star Citizens to our For the Love of Citizen series where we discuss what we love about Star Citizen. This series includes fluff, hype, and more long form content. Today, we will be reviewing Tony Zervik's most significant contribution to Star Citizen and the thing that brought me to the game, Quantum. I have been a Star Citizen backer ever since I heard about the game in 2017, but I didn't understand what the hype was about. Don't get me wrong, I thought it would be a great game. It seemed like a really good MMO. However, it took two years for me to understand just how amazing this game was. I was waiting for something. But what are you waiting for? I don't know, something amazing, I guess. It turns out, Tony Z was the one to deliver it with his watershed announcement of Quantum at CitizenCon 2949. Now, I have to ask you to bear with me as I try to make something that is extremely technical sound like it's in layman's terms. If you have some helpful information that helps people understand Quantum better, or I missed something, go ahead and drop that in the comments below. Quantum, in a nutshell, is a system of simulated AI entities that make decisions based on a small list of attributes and that compete with players for the same economic resources within Star Citizen. Each one of these quanta will have goals and personality traits that make them behave in a certain way and which will drive them towards certain activities. If you've seen my Star Citizen Greatest MMO Ever Made video, then I talked about this and mentioned that these AI would have hopes and dreams. Well, not quite, more like goals and personalities that explain how much they want to achieve those goals and their ability to achieve those goals. The first benefit of having these quanta is that they can be used to stabilize the economy of the game, which is a living, breathing economy. What do I mean by that? I mean that if all the players wanted to do was go and mine the most valuable resources and nobody ever does fuel transport, the universe would run out of fuel if that's only players in the universe. Not to mention, even if everyone did exactly what the economy was asking for, they went and got that fuel, for instance, that wouldn't be enough to meet the needs of an entire universe because of the massive size of the universe. Quanta fills that void and also provides another benefit. It gives us people to compete with in an area where PvP content may not be focused. Imagine looking for someone to fight and not being able to find anyone for hours and hours because the players are scattered throughout the universe, which is huge. That wouldn't be any fun. These quanta will always have a purpose that needs to be served by every area in the game, making the game feel more alive even when it's sparsely populated with players in certain areas. Lastly, quanta can be reactive outside the economy to things that we do in the game. Perhaps we as the players keep attacking a specific distribution center because it has very rare and valuable shipments coming in. After a dozen times of players successfully stealing from the distribution center, not only will the center increase security, but police will start to patrol the area more, making it more difficult in subsequent attempts to steal from that particular distro center. A little bit more about Quanta and some traits they will have. Each one of these traits will be on a sliding scale from one extreme to the opposite extreme, and they can change over time. An example of these traits are completely lawless and brutal pirates, or perfect gentlemen gardeners who are saints. They will have a predetermined proficiency ranging from no skill at all to near perfect at that particular skill. For instance, our brutal pirate quanta might be skilled at dogfighting, boarding, and FBS combat, but unskilled at diplomacy, farming, and medical training. Whereas our saintly farmer would have the opposite and be unskilled at dogfighting, boarding, and FPS, and be greatly skilled at diplomacy, farming, and medical. It's not just what they can do though, it's also how smart they are, how cheap they are, how much they care about morality, how much they care about money, how aggressive they are, how much they care about themselves versus other people, how risk averse they are, how much revenge matters to them, and how much ambition they have. Because yes, we need lazy NPCs too. The best part is that these traits can change based on the age and current situation of the quanta. 
For instance, a young broke quanta may seek out more dangerous money-making opportunities, while an older wealthy quanta may seek out more peaceful and safe tasks that bring purpose rather than money. Now let me add a quick note. When quanta comes online in its first iteration, it will not have every single trait I'm mentioning. Tony says they will start with four traits and build their way up from there. So it will be some time before we get the full implementation of quanta that I'm speaking of. The way that quanta will be integrated into the game is gradually. I already mentioned they are starting with four traits, but also they will mostly be used to control fuel, repair, and commodity prices at the start. Then they'll move to controlling piracy, freighters, and security. And then they'll both request and complete service beacons. So how does all of this work? Well, anything I say here will be an extreme oversimplification because I'm not the genius Tony Zervik is, and I didn't build it. So I'll link to a few Tony Z videos where he explains it perfectly, and I'll do my best here to simplify, make it kind of seem in layman's terms. The tool called Odin is what Tony Z uses to create and track all of this economy-based data. All of these quanta can't always be physicalized in the universe. That's nearly impossible with the technology we have today. However, that is why these quanta are simulated. All their actions and the subsequent reaction of the economy and universe are simulated unless a player is around to see it. And then they are physicalized so that the player can see it happen. For example, if there are a bunch of ships leaving a space station because a rare mineral was just discovered on a nearby moon, the player will see tons of ships leaving the station. But once they engage their quantum drives and leave the player's view, they will be changed back to a simulation and the rest of their actions will be simulated in just numbers. The Stanton system is expected to require 100,000 quanta for it to be filled with enough activity, but there is room for more to be added if necessary or for larger systems. Next to quantum is Subsumption AI. This couples sensory information to action selection in an intimate and bottom-up fashion. Essentially, it does this by decomposing the complete behavior into sub-behaviors. These sub-behaviors are organized into a hierarchy of layers. Each layer implements a particular level of behavioral competence, and higher levels are able to subsume lower levels in order to create viable behavior. Before you break out the dictionary, subsume means integrate or combine lower levels to a more comprehensive whole. Let me give you an example because I know that's still a word sandwich. A quanta's lowest layer could be avoid an object. The second layer would be wander around, which runs beneath the third layer, which is explore the world. Because an AI must have the ability to avoid objects, in order to wander around effectively, the subsumption architecture creates a system in which the higher layers utilize the lower level's competencies. The layers which all receive sensor information work in parallel and generate outputs. These outputs can be commands to actuators or signals that suppress or inhibit other layers. So to further this example, I'll explain and put which level they are on the screen. As the AI attempts to explore, they will start to wander around, and where there is an object in their path that would restrict their ability to wander around, they will avoid that object. The primary directive, so to speak, is to explore the world, and wandering around and avoiding objects is necessary to explore, so those are subliminal directives to achieve the primary directive of exploring the world. Virtual AI NPCs, or VNPCs for short, is our last part of the complete picture that is quantum. VNPCs are ethereal number only based entities that can become subsumption AI instantly when necessary and go back to being VNPCs as soon as their subsumption AI is not needed to keep the load on the servers low. VNPCs are always calculated. Unlike quantum, which needs to calculate, use the data, destroy the data and reset, and subsumption AI, which has to be present for us to see NPCs, but shuts off when we don't need to see them, VNPCs are essentially the constant that ties it all together. As quantum accumulates information, it creates something called a probability volume. Anytime a player or NPC completes an action which tells us who is supposed to be where, for how long, how many, for what reason, and where they need to go next. Once the action is completed, the probability volume is destroyed, and a new one is created for the next action, which saves a lot of time 
load, and computational effort on the servers. VMPCs will still remain in between the creation and destruction of those probability volumes. If a player is around, subsumption-driven AI will run until the player leaves the range of the subsumption and then it will shut off. VMPCs will remain even when it shuts off. VMPCs save time, load, and computational effort on servers as well because they work on the backend cloud-based service and are not directly on the servers. VMPCs also evolve as they live out their lives and keep track of their histories and change their actions accordingly. This is where I got my idea for hopes and dreams that I mentioned in my previous video. Whew. Now, that was a lot, but let's bring it all together. Subsumption AI is what the NPC does in the game while we're looking, and it has to be physicalized. This is all based on a kind of hierarchy of directives. Quantum is what gives those directives through calculating its traits to push the NPC toward a certain action or away from a certain action. And it also calculates what needs to happen in the universe based on the needs of the economy and based on player action. This is a computation that is done in the background and does not have to be seen, but it has to start and stop in order for the server to not explode from all that data. So at that point where quantum is stopped and no player is around to need subsumption AI to be working either, we start to need something to fill that void. That something is VMPCs. Those are what we talked about earlier. These are always executing logic, but only based on the data of the subsumption AI and the quantum. So it doesn't need to do anything except connect the dots. Lastly, let's talk about dynamic events, which are modular chunks of configurable content that affect the entire array of servers in a synchronized manner. An example of this was the Xenothread event and the Ninetales event. Quasar is the tool that lets CIG manage dynamic events in the live game. It allows CIG to nudge the game in a way that is compatible with story beats or to make it interesting when it becomes too mundane. CIG can track algorithmic models using Odin so they know what inputs to use in Quasar to get the results they're looking for. They can essentially control the entire economy with a few button presses. Now let's talk a bit about probability volumes that I mentioned earlier. These allow encounter probabilities, interdiction frequencies, loot drops, and other things that have a chance of happening or being found in the game. It allows those to be adjusted. This allows CIG to make gameplay more risk and reward oriented by placing obstacles in the way of players when they are on their way to amazing things. Whether it's to go and find them, to mine them, to salvage or cargo haul those things, it doesn't matter. Essentially, this is what adds a difficulty level to the missions that we do in the game. Now, my imagination runs wild with this, but here is an example, a little bit more of an extended version, but this is kind of how Tony explained it worked. Now, imagine you're trying to pick up volatile cargo that explodes if not handled properly from a small random outpost. You know how to load volatile cargo yourself with ease, but today you'd rather go explore while your ship is loaded by the locals because they are cheap and every credit counts. You speed off in your cyclone hoping you find just a bit of loot to bring back and encounter a group of thugs who try to rob you. You dispatch them quite easily as they aren't very high ranking thugs. As you loot their bodies you find a key, but you have no idea what it goes to. You keep traveling and eventually you find an empty hideout most likely belonging to the gang you just vanquished. You look in every box, finding very basic items, but after a few minutes of searching, you see a locked box hidden behind a bed and you open it with your key. It's a big box of weevil eggs, jackpot. You hop back into your cyclone after loading the cargo and jet back to town. You see smoke billowing from the ship landing pads as you close in on the city. You immediately beeline to the ship pads fearing the worst. Just as you arrive, a dock loading worker stops you and has a scared look in his eye. He says that something happened but you already know what happened. You knew it was possible as soon as you handed your ship over to novice volatile cargo handlers. They dropped that volatile cargo and blew up your ship. They apologize and offer to pay for half of your insurance costs as that's as much as that small station can afford. You look at your weevil eggs and you think to yourself, you better cover the other half and see. Okay, so why did I give you that example? We have all these things working together that I mentioned. We have the quantum stats of the small town dock loading workers. As they are small town, you should probably know they aren't going to have a lot of experience with volatile cargo unless some unique planetary condition makes them need to have that knowledge. That was your first mistake. Second, the interaction you had with 
both the dock workers and the thugs with subsumption AI at work. The weevil egg loot you found was quantum and probability volumes at work. And then of course, the failure to load the ship was VNPCs calculating the failure of the action behind the scenes when you aren't looking at them or in the vicinity of them based on their skills and other traits. Lastly, the price of the weevil eggs is probably high because not only do you find them in a locked boss crate, you are in a small town where these are objectively rare. But is there a market for them? Well, everything we mentioned before has to work together to figure out what that market is, where you should sell, how likely you are to be scanned by police and investigated or interdicted if you try to leave the planet, and whether anyone is buying on the planet you're currently on, among other things. I hope that example kind of brings us full circle on how it works. But if you'll remember, I said at the beginning that this changed my life. It's 100% true that is not hyperbole because I can directly link my motivation to play Star Citizen, to make content for Star Citizen and invest heavily in Star Citizen to Tony Z's 2019 demo. I might add that all of CIG helped and it wasn't just Tony alone, but if it wasn't for Tony Z doing that 2949 CitizenCon demo, I wouldn't have put so much time in learning about the game, which means I wouldn't have put so many hours into playing the game, I wouldn't have told thousands of people about the game, and I wouldn't have invested so much money into the game. But lastly, I wouldn't have become a content creator. I just wouldn't have the passion I do for the game if I didn't have Quantum to look forward to in the future. So a huge thank you to Chris Roberts, Todd Pappy, John Crew, Mark Gibson, Elwin Batchelor Jr., Jared Huckabee, Benoit Bosager, and Paul Jones too, even though he doesn't work for CIG anymore. You all are great as well, and you all gave me reasons to love Star Citizen. However, it was Tony Z that brought me to the game for the long haul. So consider this me giving him his flowers. I can't wait to see what he does next. Now give update, Tony. It's been two years, old buddy. If you like this type of content, let me know what you think in the comments below. If you don't, let me know what to fix. Otherwise, just let me know what I missed or add some more information to help people understand this great tech down in the comments. Thanks for spending your time with us. That's it for this one. See you in the next one. Peace.